Welcome to Living a Culture of Life podcast by Human Life International. I'm your host, Colleen Haupt, and I'm joined today by Jim Tui. Thank you for joining us today. Good to be with you, Colleen. And could you just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? I know that you were part of an organization. Did you start it called Aging with Dignity? Is that Did you found that, or are you just ahead of it? I founded it in uh, 1996 to affirm and safeguard human dignity by providing good counsel on end-of-life care. We're concerned about assisted suicide and euthanasia and how uh, and that was in 1996 at the time in Florida when they had a Supreme Court case and Dr. Jack Kevorkian was at work all over the country. And so uh, I founded it with with the hope of educating people on what good end-of-life care is. And we developed Five Wishes, our advanced directive, and Five Wishes is used by 40 million Americans and it's in 30 languages. So yeah, we've been at it now for 25 years. And um, uh, and so the, the, I'm the CEO of that not-for-profit, and that's where I hang my hat these days. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's, yeah, it's so important, and it's just so important to safeguard dignity at the end of life. And then I was looking through your blog, which is what originally caused me to reach out and ask about this. You write a lot about AI and healthcare, and that's something I haven't heard anybody else speak about. So can you just talk a little bit about how AI is already being used in healthcare and like the problems that poses? Well, I think you start by acknowledging that there are some very positive uses of these advances in AI in medicine. So I don't want to make it sound like it's all uh, it's all one sided bad. Uh, there, there, and I and I'll let them make that case. The, the great concern I have is that it's being introduced uh, in encroaching on patient doctor relationships. It's dehumanizing healthcare. It's putting very sick and vulnerable people in front of computer screens to try to do telemedicine. It's using their uh, the log algorithms to determine levels of care, to determine diagnosis. So, you know, while they always will tout the upsides to, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, even generative artificial intelligence, like the chat GPT that you're reading a lot about these days, the reality is it's error prone, it's unproven, it's untested, it's not moored to any ethical standards. Um, it allows for abuse. It allows human beings to say, oh, well, the machine says I have to do this, you know? So there's no accountability. So I, on, on many different levels, Colleen, it's dangerous and wrong to have it introduced without any guardrails. And that's what we have right now. There is no, there's no governmental body that's regulating this. There's no ethical body. They're just moving ahead. It's like, well, if technology says this and we can save money, let's do this. And then forgetting about the human costs as you interact more and more with what are robots now going to be the bedside companion of the dying? I mean, this, these are real questions that aren't some futuristic dystopian matter. This is the here and now. Yeah. Is it being used already? For patients? I know like telehealth is being used, but like actually having like robots there. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They were using it during COVID and uh, these chat bots and the, the, the idea of companionship by means of something automated, whether it's a fake dog or a fake person, they're moving forward, you know, where they can program the person with all your history so they can have a conversation with you. It's almost cruel to think of how this imitates human behavior, which is what all AI does, by the way. It simply means to perfect it, but it's all imitative. Even the generative AI is imitative. Imitative. I'm sorry. So uh, yeah, I, I, it, they, they're, they're, they're constantly pushing it inch by inch, encroaching more and more in people's lives, using it to justify treatment decision diagnosis. It's going to start being used by insurance companies that start reviewing documents, medical records. Why have humans do it if a computer can do it in a fraction of a second? And then where's accountability when errors are made and who's, you know, so I, yeah, I, I feel like it's not as it's presently being introduced into medicine and into healthcare, it's dangerous, it's wrong, and it needs to be stopped until there's some guardrails in place. Yeah. It seems like people just look at it and they say, this will save us money, or of course people need companionship. So why not let the robot do it because we don't have enough time or we don't have enough resources. And yeah, it definitely, I could see how that would be problematic. Is anybody else talking about it? Because like I said, you're the only person I've heard talking about this. So I think it's slowly getting out there. I think people, you know, yesterday in Congress, Sam Altman, who's the the co-founder of this chat GPT generative AI, 
uh, was before Congress warning them of how dangerous it is. I don't know. What did he have to do? Wear a sandwich board to say, here's how dangerous it is to get attention. But I mean, uh, that happened yesterday. They're starting to wake up to it. But here's the problem. If you've got a House and Senate where the members are on average 70 some years old, are they really able to even begin a discussion about what this is? You know, I've spent a lot of time trying to research it, but I'm not from that school. I'm not a coder. I'm not somebody with a technology background. So from my standpoint, it's like, why why in the world uh, would we be so late to the game and government wouldn't have hired people that have expertise that can start asking these important ethical questions? Because even 60 Minutes, when they did an AR segment recently, they they asked they asked some questions about inflation of this chat GPT that was nailing all the answers and then cited five books as sources to document its conclusions. And the problem was none of the books existed. They were completely made up. Whoa. And so that happened on camera and we watch them and go, oh boy, and they're, oh, here's their latest diversion and we're watching a football game. You know, and so, and meanwhile, while we're doing all these Trump trials and all this craziness and this circus you see in Congress, and you've got AI that's now penetrating and transforming American life and society, and it is. Ask, educa- ask educators, ask anybody who's teaching high school right now or college, yeah. whether Chad GPT has entered the arena and is transforming the, the professor-student relationship. I mean, it's challenging all the, the honor codes, everything. I feel like a lot of people look at it right now as like this fun toy. Like, oh, right. look, look what robots can right. do. and it has poses serious risks. Oh, they want, they do it intentionally that way. It's the same yeah. way they sold uh, social media. Look how good, good this will be and how it's going to connect us and help us. Now we see how addictive and destructive it is, how it's led to the compare and despair syndrome that's killed teenage girls in record numbers with suicides. And so, you know, it's always introduced as all, it's like you're now seeing the gene splitting, another technological breakthrough with huge yeah. ethical consequences. And they're saying, well, look how it's going to cure this one person here and, and lead to the elimination of this disease in this person's life. That's all great. But look what else it's going to do and what else it could do in the selective engineer, genetic engineering of human beings and altering human life. And all this is happening in broad daylight. It's not like they're sneaking this in. They've walked through the front door. And, and so it's just barging through and the tech giants are paying fortunes to the lobbyists to keep everybody distracted. They love it. It's unregulated. It's the Wild West out there. And there's a fortune to be made. That's why Google, Microsoft, Apple, they're putting tens of billions of dollars into their research here. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely something that is, I think, a new thing that we have to deal with. I like how you compared it to social media because like we've dealt with social media before and we're finally seeing the negative effects. So if we can kind of start looking at it that way of saying, okay, we kind of didn't regulate social media and look where we are with the negative consequences. Maybe we should like AI has that much more potential to be dangerous. Um, so your like your organization is like you said, talking about assisted suicide. Do you see this? Like, I guess like my question is if older people have robot as a companion, that's not going to be fulfilling. Do you see this like pushing people towards assisted suicide more? As Absolutely. Potentially- Absolutely. That's what's underway now. You're going to see it's like you're going to have twin engines on a jet right here. Mm -hmm. And one of them is going to be this this increased technology, not only invasiveness in healthcare and medicine, but the but the artificial intelligence and the use of the algorithms to dictate treatment, who gets it, who doesn't, likelihood of health, likelihood that this is the illness. And all this can be biased. This is the issue they never talk about is you just look at the results, but it can all be biased in terms of how it's programmed and coded. So the question is, who gets to determine the, the code? So if today you ask about, is someone, is, is Bill Gates controversial? It comes back, no. If you say, is Donald Trump controversial? It comes back, yes. Well, if you go out on the street today and ask people that question, you might get different answers. You know, like I would consider Bill Gates extremely controversial. His vision for life, his vision for humanity, for human life, for the conception to death, protection of life, you know? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel uh, that, that you're going to have the generative technology AI here. You're going to have assisted suicide. Right now it's legal in 10 states, District of Columbia. There are four states right now that are very close to legalizing it. 
And so here's how that plays out, just like it's doing in Canada right now. Canada started off very restrictive. You had to have a couple physicians. You had to have uh, long waiting periods. It would only be for the terminally ill who were likely to die in six months. Now today, you can have disabilities. doesn't matter whether you can live 20 years or not. Disabilities, you're eligible. Are you depressed? You're eligible. Medi even if you have mental health illness, you're eligible. They're trying to make it even for minors to access it. And so uh, all the guardrails that were in place originally, they're being discarded. Oregon's now discarding their long waiting period that they started out with. Now you can get in 15 days. So all of this is done, maybe it's from 15 days to 48 hours. I may have that wrong, Colleen. But my point is, uh, yes. So what we do is we won't treat the disabled. We won't give them supportive care at home. We won't give mental health treatment to someone who's depressed, which you get depressed when you get a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. But during that period of pancreatic cancer, people have meaningful lives. They get closure. They find forgiveness. Their suffering can be uh, meaningful in their own lives as they cope with it and manage their pain and deal with all of the beauty of life and its, in its glory, that God made it so glorious. This is man playing God now with AI and with assisted suicide when we start determining this. So my point is, you get people to despair. You get them to feel uh, you know, I can't get any health care here. I don't have any companionship. You know, I want assistance. And then we're quick to jump in. Government's quick to come and help there. Government won't provide the services, but we'll be quick to come in and provide the death care. We'll get you your assisted suicide. We won't give you treatment. We won't give you some, uh, you know, home health care so you can stay at home. We'll let you despair until you finally tire of life and its misery because we haven't served you. So you mentioned not like that we need to put guardrails on AI and not let it be introduced into healthcare until there's some kind of structure there. But you're also saying that with assisted suicide, those guardrails are being taken down. Do you think that there's any way that AI could ever be part of healthcare with guardrails that won't just be discarded as soon as it's inconvenient or as soon as the culture has been numbed another way, like another step forward? I'm doubtful. I'm okay. doubtful, but I, I can't say no because we haven't even tried. They mm -hmm. certainly could limit its use today. They could certainly limit chat GPT. In fact, all of the brain children of AI, the ones that helped found it, came forward with a letter. Elon Musk was one of them. Some of the brightest people on the planet came forward with a letter saying, moratorium, stop. Stop what you're doing right now for six months, right? So that letter came out. It gets a day in the news cycle, and on we go to the latest, you know, on Jerry Springer show. And it's just, it's, we're, we're asleep while this is going on. These are the brightest people on the planet. If you mentioned the blog I had, I actually captured the quotes of these individuals warning in broad daylight how dangerous this stuff can be. And then Sam Altman yesterday, the founder of it, saying mm -hmm. the exact same thing to Congress, nothing's happening. So yeah, all I can do is try to be a voice in the wilderness, I guess, on it. Colleen, and I'm glad that you're doing a program on it because it, your, your viewers will have an opportunity to start paying attention to this and asking elected officials, why are you sleep at the switch? Why are you letting Facebook, Microsoft, and you know Apple and Google, Amazon, all of them rule our world? They're ruling the world right now. I know I sound like a crazy old man with my head in the sand, you know, oh, all this technology, I want to go back to the manual typewriter. No, I'm not saying that. Look what's happening today. We're killing people at the bedside instead of caring for them. How is this humane? Yeah. Well, it seems to erode human dignity. Like, it's like, oh, you're not worth having another person care for you and having like humans. Maybe you can talk about this a little bit. What the care humans can give that a robot couldn't like why it's important that we have that personal at, I mean, right. at end of life, but all throughout life, we need personal interactions. Picture at your bedside, a neighbor that you knew was a, was an inveterate liar. And that person never was truthful and came to your bedside and now is telling you a bunch of stuff about yourself, you, there'd be such a sincerity gap that you'd have a hard time taking in one word they're saying because you just don't believe them. When you have a computer there, from the get-go, this chat robot, and they're developing them right now at Google. They showcase what they're doing. Musk is developing a master robot. They're all doing it right now. They're all in development. It's all in their laboratories. Then they march it out. I, I love the 60 Minutes Google episode in their lab at Google, and they were showing robots playing ping pong, and it was just so lovely, and they're playing soccer, and they're 
so cuddly. There's a little dog that'll jump up and you can, and the dog that does whatever you want it to do. And, you know, so it's all so innocent. But, you know, that's that's not the reality of how this plays out because that computer by your bedside, even if you programmed it to know every detail of your life, all your children's names, your grandchildren's names, where you went to school, what was it like at Florida State University? You know, to be, to be able to ask questions, that person dying there knows you're a robot. They want a human being. They're like, what's happened to my human life? See, this is the problem. We're dehumanizing our world. We're making it for only the elites that can survive in this. What happens to the poor and disabled and their companionship, their, their right to services? We're just going to say the only service you're going to get is an assisted suicide service. I, I, it's a disgrace what Canada's doing. They will go down in human history as, as a fraud government. This whole thing, you know, I, I loved how they made out this brash prime minister Trudeau that the guy's in his 50s now. He's not a kid. He's ushering in this dystopian world of his own vision. It's not my world, and I don't think it's most Americans' worlds, but we don't know truly what's going on. Yeah, it's scary to see what's going on up there. I had a girl on the podcast uh, a few months ago who's from Canada, and she was talking about the need to talk about death, but she she brought up, I think on the, I know we brought up in conversation, she was talking about Canada and what's going on there. Um, but now going into, you wrote a book on Mother Teresa and you knew her personally. Can you talk a little bit about why she's a great model of how we should treat people with dignity and the way that we should actually like robots in one hand, Mother Teresa on the other, why we should try to be like Mother Teresa? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you think of Mother Teresa, you think of her early work in her home for the dying that she opened in 1952, taking people in off the streets and loving them, cleaning them, holding them till they die. You know, she she really modeled pa good palliative care, did the best she could so that they at least, you know, had the god-given dignity affirmed and 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 proclaimed um so yeah mother Teresa saw the power and that's why i titled the book to love and to be loved because um she felt that was the most important need of a human being was to love and to be loved not only can government not love robots can't love chat gpt yeah. can't love these little these devices we're creating can't love that's why it's funny i I saw Mark Zuckerberg is now bailing on metaverse because it was a bridge too far for Americans. They were like, what? We got to walk around with goggles now to enjoy life, you know, and to live in an alternative reality. That's why those, those fungible tokens scam that went on where you could own a precious, you're the only one that owns this, but it's make believe and it's in the metaverse, you know? So that was a big lie. So Americans, when they actually focus on and they go, that's baloney. But what we haven't done with the AI is we're just watching encroaching slowly. Now it's in the middle. If you use Bing, Microsoft's using generative AI in their Bing search. And you're not even aware of it. And so it's gathering information. When you make a simple request like, will I get constipated if I eat cabbage? You know, <laughs> I'm not saying that there, there's a bias on cabbage. But there might be a bias if you ask who is Robert E. Lee and whether you even get a historical account. You know. Yeah. What kind of truth will you get when you ask, is, is abortion a moral choice? Who's going to decide that information? And how's that going to be presented in a search? And it's all biased by this huge accumulation and the algorithm that drives traffic into your, onto your screen. Well, that's something I never thought about is who's actually programming, programming these computers to come up with the results. Like, that's a really good point. I think we think of the robots as like having access to everything on the internet and then being able to kind of filter it. And they're not humans. They can't do that. They're programmed to filter things in a certain way. And yeah, that's true. Someone's controlling the answers. Not only that, but these robots are becoming uh, so uh, nearly sentient, that word where they're almost like human in that they can respond to the kind of conversation you and I are having. Uh, it's, it's getting more and more easy to dupe someone with fake, with, uh, with an avatar that's a fake you. And then they tape your voice for a little bit and they can simulate your voice and your expressions and imitate. It's all imitative, all of it. And so with and, and as a result, soon, you, you know, that you can recreate the dead to come back and talk. If they just have some video of you when you were alive talking and doing this and they can program all this information and that person can carry that avatar can carry on a conversation with you as if they're still alive. So is that human? No, it's positively not human. Is that a thrilling thing to some people? I suppose it floats people's boats. But I think what's happening is Americans are beginning to awaken. 
And COVID, COVID started this. Americans are beginning to awaken to these dehumanizing forces that, for example, in COVID separated people from the bedside of their loved ones when they were dying, saying, oh, gee, we don't want you to give them COVID. So let them die alone in isolation. That wasn't humane, wasn't no. compassionate. Yeah, Mother Teresa teaches us what real compassion looks like. She wasn't wearing a mask in the slums with the lepers. She wasn't sitting there petrified she might get TB. She was there loving and caring. She wasn't reckless. She took the precautions. She washed her hands. But that safetyism that we see so pervasive in society is also part of this movement now in medicine that's making it more inhumane, less personal. And, and nurses feel trapped in these systems. I was just at a conference of nurses speaking to 200 of them the other day. They want to give health care. They want to love the patients and be tender and kind. And, and the system's pushing them from bed to bed in two minutes and do this. And, you know, and they, and they see what AI is driving them, you know, to write up the reports quickly or we'll write them up for you. And it can all be fabricated and faked now with chat GPT. Truly. That's not me making this up or dangerously saying you can go to chat BT and say, give me a report on a patient with a fever of 98.9 who presented with this and that. And they will come up with a five and I want 500 words and they'll come up with a long story about it and the treatments and the medicines and all this. Me, I'd, I'd like a human being that can weigh all the factors and look you in the eye and come up with a humane, rational course of action for it. Not saying AI hey, can't be a piece of a puzzle, but it's becoming the whole puzzle. Yeah, it's like technology can be a good tool when it's used properly, but when it's like just takes over everything, then like you need it's better to have the human making that final decision and being the one to provide that care. So. I think we're going to see in not too distant future at banks, for example, where certain transactions you will have to do in person because there's so much computer sophisticated fraud now that you can do with, with AI that they will just simply require a human being to show up and do the transaction themselves. That's how good it's gotten. I watched a Wall Street Journal clip of a woman that went and had her own avatar created and then had that avatar participate in Zoom calls and with a call with her girlfriend and you know with others and who was fooled and who wasn't. And half of them were fooled and half weren't. So that shows you where this technology is right now. They're halfway there. Yeah. You know, it's underway, it's under development. And as they showed with chess, when they created that super chess computer, uh, it took forever to get to the point where they were almost the best. It took very little time for it to then become the best. Yeah. So that once they get to a certain point, the improvements are immediate, quick and lasting. I also saw a video the other day. This is not exactly AI, but along the thing of robots where a teacher was saying like, Oh, I've been teaching for a number of years and I've had the kids accidentally call me mom or whatever. And she said, first one, like first time ever, I was accidentally called Alexa. And I was like, that's terrifying that kids are like, you speak to Alexa as if it's a person and it's a robot. And the fact that now they're calling like their teacher, like, Alexa, can you like do right. X, Y, or Z for me? And that's a compliment. <laughs> right. And people have grown accustomed to it. It's that, you know, ro robots are in the house cleaning the floor. What's his problem? Why isn't he okay with that? I don't care about the robots cleaning your floor. I don't care about robots playing ping pong. They do that stuff to familiarize you and to make you comfortable. It's normalizing the abnormal. That's abnormal to have computers and in, in, in so invasive in your human life to where, and, and of course now we're finding they're recording you, they're filming you, all this stuff is going on. So yeah, I, I feel like, uh, when I look at a president who's way past his prime, Trump, who's only interested in himself, you're like, who's going to be out there raise, addressing these important questions? We're going to leave this to China? Good luck with that and their ethical norms. How's that worked out so far for them and their social monitoring of their people and the suppression of their people? You know, we're sitting here just indifferent about all this technology that's become so much a part of our lives. And, and we think, oh, it'll never happen in America. Really? Uh, you're at the airport now where they're scanning eyeballs so you can avoid being in a line. They're going to get, watch what happens with Clear. I blogged on that a while back, that Clear company. They're developing a huge database. So that will become the normative identification to have your eye scanned. Is that dystopian? You tell me. You know, what happens if they make a mistake and you no longer exist because your eye scan's not registering? You know, and this is what they'll just immediately eliminate you. This is 
This is all the dystopian films I grew up watching, like Brazil, coming to life now. And we're watching it in real time. Yeah. And it's like crazier than you would have thought back then, too. I'm sure so. people are listening. They hear my elevated voice and they're like, what's his problem? Guy, he's got hang ups. Alexa's great. If I want to know what the weather is in Phoenix, I can get an answer right away. I'm not opposed to Alexa. And I am an addict for my Google Maps so that I can find where I'm going. I have a horrible sense of direction. That's not the uses that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about, let's go back to the manual typewriter. What we are talking about is the dehumanization of life and the removal of the human element, compassion, the things that are uniquely human that God endowed us with, the reason and faith that we have. Science has become so muscular and reason so dominant that there's no allowance. And unfortunately, our faith communities are nearly silent on this now. They're not raising any alarms. It's, it's disturbed, but they're all, they have their own problems that they're dealing with. And so, you know, we're living in a post-Christendom world. And so that's the reality. That's why there's an attack on life. That's why there are people are out there proudly proclaiming abortion, you know, as a solution. Mother Teresa yeah. was very clear about the dangers in a society when you allow abortion. And I would say AI is a consequence of the abor abortion culture. Really? Why would you say that? Just because, because it, once you depreciate like human life, everything else is up for grab. When you can do it in the womb, you can do it at every other every other point on that continuum. That makes sense. Do you have any great stories from Mother Teresa of like, I don't know, your experiences knowing her or like times she was treating people with dignity, like in how she was an example of that? Well, Colleen, you're gonna have to get the book. Uh, I do. I have a bunch. I mean, there are too many. Uh, the reason I wrote the book was she was such a beautiful human being. Mm -hmm. I mean, saints don't become saints in spite of their humanity. They become it through it. Mm -hmm. She was a mother. She was a woman, fearless, gritty, Albanian. She, you know, during world, during the riots when India was being partitioned, she was outside the compound collecting rice to feed 300 children trapped inside the, the school boarding house. You know, she, she started out that order on her own and, and grew it to 120 countries and 760 missions by the time of her death. I mean, she was just a, she loved to laugh. She loved poetry. She loved music. She liked to sing. She loved chocolate. She got mad. She was stubborn. She was impatient. She wasn't sinless. She was, you know, people that want to make saints out to be perfect. Those aren't saints. Mm -hmm. You know, human beings aren't perfect. We're, you know, my faith, you know, tells me that Christ is you know, we, we are perfected, you know, it's a process, that path of holiness. And so, yeah, yeah Mother Teresa was just, you know, and I watched her go around the dying and she'd just rub their chests and look them in the eyes and just connect with them, you know, and assure them. She was a mother, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, I tell all these stories from her sisters. I, I knew her the last 12 years of her life, so I also talked about how she aged. I'm really worried mm -hmm. about the elderly. And how we're pushing them to despair, all the loneliness, no accompaniment. Uh, you know, we there is terrible poverty in Calcutta with people starving, but in America, the spiritual poverty is immense. People yeah. are very dying of hunger for friendship, hungering for friendship. So yeah, Mother Teresa has a lot to teach us. Yeah, no, I I agree. I remember hearing a description one time that like all evil dictators are all the same. But like every saint is so unique and so special and they're just like have like the love shining through. It's like I love this analogy for many different things, but like a stained glass window is like beautiful on its own. But when like that light shines through it, it's like that much more brilliant. And I feel like that's kind of who she was like the light, like God's love just illuminated her personality. It didn't it wasn't like trying to get rid of her personality. That's a beautiful image and very true. And, and that image in mother is true in the dying and in the disabled, that same image of God. And when we deface it through our inhumanity, uh, it's a disgrace, you know, and it's a, a stain on this on civilization. So um, that's why, you know, can telemedicine be useful? Sure. You know, rural areas, I get it. But like I was with a, a man with Parkinson's who wanted to see a doctor badly. And, you know, so he has no technological savvy. So I, I went over with a laptop so he could do a Zoom call because that's all they offered. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And I just watched him sitting there in his little assisted living facility room, uh, talking to a screen where a doctor's there. There's no relationship. There's no warmth. There's no bedside manner. A, com- a computer screen can't provide any of that. It's not like he's fooled like, oh, it's like she's here. She's not there. It's a screen. I'm like, you and I are doing this interview. This is great. This is Zoom. This is what Zoom can do. That's yeah. fine for an interview. I always like in person better, don't you? Yeah, same. Yeah. It's just a better interview. It's but, a more natural conversation. Yeah, but when you're talking about your own life and your aches and pains and all, and you see that person's going to click off in four minutes and 58 seconds before your time runs out as you're talking there and pouring out your heart about your aches and pains, and then this person and you know it just it's not it's not it's not care to call it health care that word care comes from the heart it's where the root of it there's no heart in this there's no compassion there's not you can't be compassionate that way maybe as a patchwork i get it but if that's the access that the poor are going to get where they come in and they've just been beaten by their spouse and they're pouring out their grief uh, with their injuries and they're talking to a computer. Really? That's what medicine's become the practice of medicine. It's inhumane. It is. Yeah. And then you said, is your book out yet? Did you come out yeah, last September? Out. Or is it coming out? Yeah, you can get it at Barnes and Noble target, or you can get it on Amazon or any of the, you know, Simon and Schuster has their own website. The paperback comes out in September. It's in, it'll be in five languages. Um, Okay. By August, Italian's coming out. It's already in Spanish available, and it's available in Portuguese, and then it's available. Uh, what's the other one? Italian, Portuguese, Spanish. Oh, and in uh, Hungarian. Hungarian. Wow. Go figure. Well, I'll link it in the bio so that our listeners can check it out because I'm, I'm interested. I'd love to hear stories. Right, click on it, and you can find it off agingwithdignity.org, uh, okay. off our website. You can get the book, or you can. Um, uh, you can just go through Amazon. They'll get it to you tomorrow. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for this conversation today. It's such an important topic to be able to talk about and like just recognize that like humans need humans. We need human interactions and relationships and a computer can never do that for us. Well, God bless you, Colleen and Human Life International for caring and, and doing the work you do. It's faithfulness that matters. Yes. Well, thank you so much. And to all of our listeners, please like, follow, subscribe. Um, thank you for joining us today. Keep on living the culture of life and God bless.